we are talking about curation. Am I right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'm going to just throw something out, and I'm, I know that John can edit this out if he needs to. Some people consider curation to be the lazy instructor's approach to instruction. I don't consider it to be because I think the work of learning really needs to be more in the hands of the learner. And lots of times we do some of the, um, of the tough stuff for them. So that's kind of the, um, the gist of, of where I'm coming from. That if we can put more um, routine, systematic, across the semester opportunities into students' hands to uh, build content, generate content, and use it, then I think we are showing them that they are very much a part of the learning community and that they have some say in their destiny. So that all, all that philosophy aside, uh, we're going to focus somewhat on some examples and tools and whatever. How many people are on devices right now? I see one. One person. You're on your laptop. Okay. Um, that's all right. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Um, because I wanted to try something, but we can do this also just by um, shouting out. So this is the, um, the URL for, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see it. It's also in the chat. Um, if you're if you're on the if you happen to be on your device, let me share screen. Hello. It's always which screen should I share? Okay. All right. So I promise you, this is not going to be one slide after another after another. Um, but this is the URL for the slide deck if you want to come back to it. Many of the things I'm going to show you have links built into the slides so that you may want to. Um, and as I say to my students, if you can't sleep on Saturday night, this is a perfect way to go to sleep, entertaining content. So um, it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y, curate, C-U-R-A-T-E hyphen learn. So uh, I think the simple answer, what, are, what do you think the answers to the question? What happens when students do the work? Anybody have any um, midday thoughts right before we start back from break? They text. <laughs> they text. They do that, yeah. They like it better, I think. I think they do. I think they feel like they're one part of it. Lots of times they feel like they are doing the work. I actually had a student say, what am I paying the big bucks for to me in contrast? <laughs> and other students say, can I do more of it? And others say, how many words, right? How many words does it need to be or how long does it need to be? So we get, we get that full range. And yes, they like to entertain themselves often rather than um, doing things in the framework that we've built for them. So they're very good at texting, are they not? Um, so I think that what we are about today is talking a little bit about what it's all about um, and then looking at a couple of core strategies. While doing so, I'm hoping that you're going to be thinking about where each of us is with our own agenda with our students. And as um, Cool Cat teacher, Vicki, oh, I always block on her last name. John, do you remember Vicki's last name? Cool Cat Teacher blog, oh, at any rate. What she says is, innovate like a turtle. So um, I don't know if you, when you attend conference sessions and conferences and MOOCs and everything else, you make the to-do list and you go like this, holy cow, how am I going to do all this? Well, you don't. You pick a little something that you want to innovate with you pick a gap that makes sense in your, um, that you're experiencing in maybe one of your courses or two of your courses, and then you, or, you, or if you do professional development, professional development, um, and then you try it in that gap. So I love her. She usually shows a turtle, a cute little turtle, when she talks about this, but innovate like a turtle. So dig deep and do it 
in little bits. So, um, what's going on here? All right. So here's what we're going to try remotely. Let's. It usually works well synchronously. So let's see how we do when um, I'm not in the room. Is there a word that you would use to describe what curation is all about, or a critical skill that you think of when it comes to curating? You can either share it aloud. And John, are you um, are you on a device? Mm -hmm. I'm on my or is John on 12 devices? <laughs> um, so I have this Google Doc set up that is bit.ly curation hyphen terms. I'm going to open that. And I can type in as people shout out. Yeah, John's on a few devices. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. I could tell your iPhone was talking. Um, and what we're going to try, what we're going to do is either um, type into it or shout out terms and one of us can type into it. Right now, my browser is going very slow. So what are some things that come to mind when you think of curating? Discriminating in that, like, kind of choosing something that's better over another, or having mm -hmm. to right? okay. For some reason, I can't get to the doc. I'm in it, I got it. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> so, yay! <laughs> so, um, kind of sorting, right? Or you got it, right? Yeah, okay. There we go. Other things, yeah, evaluating. Preserving, the anonymous penguin says. <laughs> Preserving, yeah. In fact, curation came from the whole library museum venue, right? We, we who were not in those fields, that wasn't part of our job before. Any other words? You're seeing some here. Also, like... Um with curation is often like dissemination. Right, right. Especially today, the assumption is you're going to be publishing in some way, um, sharing the information. So, and that gives some authenticity to it. We know that we benefit as museum goers and uh, people who use libraries, whether they're virtual or not, we benefit from other people sorting and publishing and preserving. So now we get to do it or help our students do it as well. So I wanted to try to do something. Any other words you want to contribute before I do something with these words? Are there any on this list that you think we should get rid of before we leave, before I do something with some maybe some magic that you think maybe other people may not have been right on the same page? Some people wrote someone wrote dusty shelves from another session. <laughs> they must have been in my office. Okay, all right. So we're going to try something. And, and I think this is the danger that I'm going to show you something that you do not want your students to do at home. <laughs> this is dangerous. It's one of those. I spent yesterday with two chemists and um, in a professional development session, and they kept on telling me if they, we have to make sure they know the basic skills because if they don't, everything will explode. And so I'm hoping this doesn't explode. All right, let's see what happens. So I'm going to go into something called Drive Word Cloud, which um, is a word cloud tool that works with Google Drive. Go figure, that's the name. So it lets me select a file from Google Drive, and I think I called this terms. Okay, curation terms. It's gonna ask me if, if it can, um, Oh, look, I had already been in there, so it, it did that for me. Let's see if it has all the things in it. No, okay. 
I'm going to do another instance of it. Okay, try it again. I had been in here before making sure everything was kind of working. <laughs> so looking for that doc, there it is. I'm going to now ask it to create a Word file. Let's see if it's the right one now. has all of our words in it, right? Okay, so underneath it is the Word cloud that was built from our words. Now, if this is one thing you leave with, that would be cool, because this is a cool tool. Look what I can do with it. Um, free, easy. I can change all kinds of things about it. Not all kinds of things, but I can change a lot of things about it. Am I making you sick yet? <laughs> okay. Um, I can, so I often do this with my students when we are, I'm trying to figure out what their background knowledge is around things. So I ask them to, you know, if you were looking this up at the library, what keywords would you use? And let's type it into this Google Doc, or you help me type it in, or pull out your phone and stop texting, and, and open up that Google Drive app, and then we're going to show these things, and then we're going to make some decisions about them. But initially, I'm asking them to just collect them. That is the clue. Now, I know they're fancier word cloud tools, but I like to use stuff that people can synchronously and asynchronously contribute to without a whole lot of mess. So I often start, start with this. So let's talk about this. That's what we just did. Is this effective curation or not? What do you think? I think there's no like, there's no priorities and there's no kind of like hierarchy of like what's most important or not. So I think often in curation, there's, there's some of that. So in well done curation, we apply a set of rules or judgments or make some decisions about structure. Great. Yes. Anything else that makes it or doesn't make a curation, you think? I'm not sure I see meaning. I think that curation would have a classification that has meaning. Yes. Okay. Oh, can you hear my dog? Can you hear my dog? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, right. So, lots of times things are indexed or categorized, or we've, you know, we have a navigation strategy to get through them. So, um, that doesn't exist here either. I mean, we could go in and color code the words in another app or whatever, but right now, I think probably the best term to describe what we have would be a, what do you think? Collection, group, yeah. Um, bucket is a term that's used in some venues. So, um, I think it is potentially healthy to do something like this when you start out, when you start introducing what your expectations is for student work, to go through something like this, and it can even be more concrete. It can be with cookies, um, literally, ones that you eat. It can be with pictures. It can be with... Um, videos that they have looked at on YouTube. It can be uh, commercials on television. Anything that will get, them, get students to begin to understand that a playlist alone in their language is a collection. It is not necessarily a curation according to the things that we want them to do. So it is just a collection, but it is a collection. It's a great starting point. So implicit are the words that you guys have been using because you're smart and you should be doing this session. <laughs> so um, I love this image because it shows that we're putting tons of things and skills into the sieve and then ending with 
the thing that is a representation of all of the invisible work that we've done, the searching, collecting, filtering, and then finally the compiling. So for me, I have an, a special asterisk, and that is that for me, collaborating is an important element when I do curation with students, even though they may be doing some independent work. Um, I like to build in the interdependence, even if it is at the publishing and peer review side of things. But if they can work on those earlier tools, skill sets, searching, collecting, filtering, etc., with each other, I think we are increasing the number of instructional hits. I mean, that's a good thing. Um, instructional rehearsals on things. And that that um, process can interrupt the texting distractions and may help keep them focused because I'm only one little person and I don't move so fast anymore. So it would be great if I had a whole lot of mini-me's running around. And that's why I love um, some of the collaboration interdependence. So, so why do we have to do this? Anyhow, you know these things. Um, in the old days, we had to access the stuff. Today, it's how do we how do we choose? How do we remix it? How do we get to the point of it with all of the information that's out there? And I'm not sure if you know this site, the Internet in Real Time. Um, that was just an image of it in the slide deck. I have a very, very slow browser here today. I'm looking. I don't have anything extra open. Um, but if you click to this URL, you will you, I, I embed this constantly in my learning management system shell for my students. And I ask them to periodically click to it and tell me, you know, since you started to look at this, um, how many YouTube videos were published? How many? Oh, did you guys get this? Is the website offline? wasn't a little bit ago. Okay, All right, so what it does is it, it does an ongoing um, tally of from the moment that you log on to it, what happens in Yelp land, what happens in YouTube, what happens in Amazon, and it's powerful. It's fascinating, it's scary. Um, for me, it convinces me that we need to sort and re- mix things for the needs that we have over and over and over again. So it's just kind of one of those whacks on the side of the head. Um, and the other big reason is we know that we have skill fade going on. You know, we are, we are, we, definitely our students, are a Google generation, and I do not mean Google Apps, I mean Google, what should I do? <laughs> Who should I call next? I'm kidding here. But, you know, what is da 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 So the, um, the effort that we need to continue um, on that path of Google-proofing the learning experience and addressing the skill fade that I, I think we are seeing with our, our students is ongoing. Um, so having them use a number of skill sets over and over and over again for different purposes and then publishing to authentic audiences. We've got to figure out ways to do it. So it's not about the tool, but we're going to be looking at a couple of tools. Um, so I wanted to just give you some examples. These are from my teaching practice. I failed to tell you what my day job is. It's usually working with um, pre-service teachers in the College of Education at Fredonia. And um, but lots of, more and more, I'm working with our first-year students who are not, some of them not in a major yet, some of whom are, who will be switching a few more times, as we know. And um, so I, and then I get to do some professional development work as well through our Office of Online Learning and through our Professional Development Center. So, um, so these are samples drawn from my practice in teaching. A lot of them are with, um, our future teachers of America, and say that lovingly. Um, so, and several are, are Google. I won't um, st stay with Google, but I did want to give you some examples. Um, I think that the 
it, built into the slide deck are several of these that are demo versions. So I've removed students' names, etc. And you can take a look at the at the things that we've done together. Um, and I'm just going to hopefully start with this one. Um, this is an example of taking some background knowledge built through a learning path using textbook and some learning activities in an online, a fully online class where students had the option to pick an area that they were comfortable with or wanted to, to explore further and um, find exemplars out in the real world. I hope you're having a little better luck than I am getting places. Um, I'm going to close one more tab and see if that helps. Um, and what they did is had to find example, examples, so YouTube videos or blog posts or whatever um, around using the strategy. In this case, the slide deck that these students picked was using virtual manipulatives. Now, this is not a course on technology. This is an ad site course. So um, I set up a very simple template and it looks like this. You get two slides. You go in and you type your name in and your link and then on the second slide you add some bulleted points that connect what you've just learned to what you found and then you go away. Later on, you come back, make comments, use the slides for other purposes, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, but what I, what I did for this particular unit of study is let students choose their emphasis area. So they, everyone did not have to read the entire set of three chapters they got to pick, but they also were not responsible for teaching each other the content they were responsible for finding the exemplars, and the exemplars could not come from the textbook. Um, and um, we know that students love videos, so why not? However, in their own, the two, two things that you won't see, in their own notes, I have them, my online students do a running Google Doc that they put a lot of things into for each of the instructional modules. So it can be personal notes, it can be answers to study questions, it can be reflections, it can be pinky squares with me about certain things or whatever, but they're guided in putting it all in one doc and then share it with me, it's part of their portfolio for that work, and then I review it in the context of other things that they submit like this as gradable items. In their reflection in this parallel Google Doc, they tell me what rating on a scale of one to three they give their video or their resource. They explain why it meets the standards that we have set and I give them standards. Um, and they give me an example of two other things they didn't pick for this. So I ask them in a very micro way to show me some of their thinking process and how they have collected, sorted, evaluated against our very simple scale and then why they put the thing in. So it's kind of narrating their thinking process and so that's one thing. The other thing, so that's a, that's a personal thing. This is almost like handing a paper into a, this slide deck, even though it's electronic and shared with potentially anyone, is just like a paper handed in if we don't do something with it. So it dies when the paper gets handed in. You've all heard that metaphor. Um, so it's important that for me, that students not just put it out there, publish it, and we've created a curation, haven't we? Um, because, and it was done collaboratively. A few people contributed to this. So now my part of the job is to figure out a way for students, other students and these to have to come back to this curation to learn, to play with, to um, add to, to use in other ways. And the way that I use, have them use these things in the EdSci class 
is I give them case studies and I ask them to go to the knowledge base that our class has compiled on fill in the blank, in this case, these three instructional uh, strategies, and identify browse, identify at least fill in the blank, two resources that you can use, apply to the situation, extend, ask questions about or whatever, and then go forth and, and complete the case study. They also use other materials, not compiled by students, for example, the textbook, um, stuff that they will have learned to build their um, evolving competence as well as this. And I always give them guidance as you're solving the case study, you need to have, you know, you need to cite, you need to um, use not just YouTube videos, but at least some reference to the text, et cetera, et cetera. So, or Google Scholar, whatever the guidance that I come up with. So their final product is not a paper, but it is um, a solution to an instructional problem in this case, using multiple sources. That iterative process happens through the whole course, but using different types of content. Much of it includes, but is not exclusive to, stuff that students have compiled themselves. So, um, and the structure of it is simple and easy for me. So I can just keep a master Google slide deck of things like this. And then I just change the title, the course number, and um, if I need to, you know, change some other elements in the directions, and then just go like this, duplicate the slide, duplicate the slide, duplicate the slide, and then I have another version of it. So it's important for me in terms of efficiency to keep a clean, unpopulated uh, shell that I can use over and over and over again for different purposes. Um, it gets shared as an editable file in the learning management system. So I don't use Google Classroom. We're in Moodle. Um, so it, it gets, it, it, all it is is a URL. In Moodle, it's called a URL. Um, in your Blackboard site, it's you know just the, the website tool. So pretty straightforward. So does that make sense as far as um, structure and how I use it? Questions about that? It's not fancy, as, as they say. Um, so same kind of um, situation if you've been browsing. I have um, fact sheet templates that I set up. I have for um, various strategies. I have, sometimes I have students build a um, study guide for chapters associated with textbook if I'm using it or readings. Um, if John scanned around the room, was anyone in the last session that I did? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, the, the folks who were in the last session saw that um, we, with the freshmen, compiled a Google map using all of our wits about us to um, curate cool and necessary places around campus. Um, I won't get into the, the AR part of it, but when we are taking information and remixing it and recompiling it and editing and filtering it, it doesn't have to be in a more traditional text format. It can be using almost anything. So again, it's not tool dependent. In this case, my template was the information that I wanted them to put into the information bubble for each of their map sites. So, those are examples of, of uh, template-based strategies. I also use what I call targeted compilations. And so I wanted to just share a couple with you just for the, the fun of it. There are so many wonderful, curate, literally, they're called curation tools. Some of us have used them for our own purposes to compile things for students. I think we need to do that to model, but I also think we need to put 
some of that work at least into the hands of our learners because again we know how to vet content we also know how to use standards to make decisions about how relevant things are witness the current fake news phenomenon that all of a sudden has hit the bricks but it's been with us for a very long time i just love this time in our lives um, as far as the challenges. So I wanted to show you kind of an embedded strategy for doing curations. So, and it's coming, I think. What's going on today, huh? It's just cold outside. Um, so another slide deck. I love slide decks because students seem to like them. It gives them a confined zone to, to write stuff in and easily exportable and easily skimmable. Um, in Google and in some other tools, we have the capability to provide ongoing feedback, commenting, etc. I think that's an important element of the building process. Um, now I'm really stuck. Ha ha ha. Um, so in this, in this, um, slide deck, I asked students um, previously, they engaged in a lot of things before they got to this point. They read some articles, they participated in an online, this is a fully online course, online discussion forum. Um, they captured their uh, reflections from their discussion board and they created a, an image and they labeled the image using screen um, you know, screen annotation tools. Um, I'll try once, one more thing here. Is anyone else on that curation? Um, and then what they had to do is compile for um, their colleagues a curation, a curation of their own. So they posted it to a Google slide, which then became like the mega curation. And they used curation tools that they had already studied about. So this is one student, notice he, what he says. Andrew is often very literal. He's practicing curation here. <laughs> and so what he used was um, at TES, this is called blend space. So in blend space, you build in a, a nice little grid and then you can present and all this is is a holder of links um, then you can present in a, a presentation format i can open these in separate tabs and what's nice about some of the more elegant like this one curation tools is you can both build in quiz questions comments and um, docs you can also have discussions so what what andrew did is find three things essential to his understanding about 21st century learning and teaching that's what we were talking about and compiled them now separately after they did this i asked them to then do a screencast that gave us the backstory. Why does this resonate with you, future teacher? How do you, what are you learning from this? How are you going to use it in the future? So they had to do a three minute um, screencast that provided what we called a little hook to each other about how their selection, their curation of tools would be the thing that you would wanna write to mom about. So I do all this hyping, silly hyping about things. Um, so they pick, got to pick different curation tools um, and take their content that they had vetted and had learned something about and recompile it in a very short curation. Um, in the slide deck itself, I don't think it's still up there, um, they just provided a link to their curation as well as a link to the actual tool. So um, 
we then use this material as we went forward in the course because they had a, they assumed a lot of responsibility for continuing to help each other um, learn new things. So I made sure that we were coming back and kind of being reminded that of the iterative process of using the knowledge base that we had jointly compiled. So it's kind of layer on layer using this Google slide deck as a way to hold everything like a bookshelf, easy to use, um, you know, basically no learning curve, one link, but embedded in that slide deck were each student's, what was a compilation of the full classes um, work. I wanted to introduce you to a different concept and I think this has some um, potential play. This is not exactly what I would suggest that you do unless you are already um, having students do videos in your class. But using the playlist approach to things I think may resonate with students more so than some of the other um, strategies the text-based strategies in particular. Um, so asking students to put together a playlist about fill in the blank um, in your discipline, in your course or whatever. And, and then I would again suggest that a backup piece that they need to do would be tell us why that thing is in there. What else did you look at and did it include? And what is somebody supposed to get out of it? What is the connection to, you know, your concept or whatever? Um, so that same strategy that I ask people to use in the, you know, in the slide deck or whatever, I think becomes a necessary element of tracing your thinking because it may not be visible from the final product that's published. And there may be a reason that it looks like crap because it may be, <laughs> and I say that, with all kinds of respect for students, but sometimes it does get done in the five minutes before class starts. Um, so this is a curation of my honors class, actually doing all the legwork to produce uh, videos to be used by the campus as our campus transition to Moodle, which our campus calls OnCourse. Um, so my honors class took on as a service learning project building documentation I will show you the um, their questions that they compiled if I can get into Google Drive there we go um, so this is their their question list and text instructions as well as video demo video tutorials for students to use um, as we made the transition to um, to on course so underlying all of this is um, 14 weeks of figuring out what's essential, um, how are we going to go about it, how are we sharing the wealth of the work, notice I called it wealth, um, to, to generate friendly and functional and well done, both text and image documentation and videos. So the index itself becomes a curation, but it's a curation of their own work. How cool is that? Um, so, and um, in the process, and I think this is something that you may want to think about, you may not want to think about, but we have this constant elephant in the room of whose work is it anyhow. And sometimes it is a mashup, but we need to know that students actually understand how to give credit for work that isn't theirs. So um, this group uh, create, learned about Creative Commons. There was a team whose job was to learn about Creative Commons and go make a decision about the license that they were going to put on all of the work that they created. I'll make this a little bit bigger. They made a proposal to the group and said, this is the license that we think we should use and then they put that Creative Commons license on everything that they built um, through this process. Um, they didn't know about, they were honor students from freshmen to seniors, they didn't know about licensing. They, they just thought that's the usual, if you cite it, you can use it, whatever it is. 
Um, so it was a wonderful way to, again, more authentically help them understand some of the complexities of using as well as building content and making sure that people understand how you want it to be, um, how it should be used and how you want it to be used. So the, the index becomes a text-based example of curation and the video playlist um, is certainly, and I think resonates with students, even if you start using playlists rather than curation, it probably will make sense to them. Um, so each one of these is a video that they storyboarded um, and then produced and published through our online learning office at Fredonia. So um, got a lot of bang for our bucks out of that. Underline it all is a bunch of, you know, I call them working tools, you know, Google tools. Um, we did use Camtasia for producing, no, did we, I can't remember what, what, what they use for producing the video. Um, but, um, so, and then for those of you who love VoiceThread, I think that VoiceThread has a ton of potential as, uh, again, a collector of information. I'm going to just take my earbuds off for a second and see if I can get this to. Now that we're going to be thinking about cooperative learning. So we've read things, we've looked at videos, we've decoded them, we've experienced group work, and some of us have actually. Hi, it's Jamie. As you might already know, I'm a speech major, and in speech, we don't always get the opportunity to use group work in cooperative learning. However, in school settings, groups are more commonly found. In these cases, as an SLP. As a student, I have experienced multiple group learning activities in which I had to carry a hefty part of the workload. And with that being said, something I think I need to focus on as a future teacher is preventing this from happening to any of my future students. So in order to make this happen, I need to consider whenever using a cooperative learning technique, that each student is responsible for an equal share of the workload. Since I am hopefully going to be teaching at the elementary level, one way to distribute responsibilities evenly among my students is to set up roles or jobs for any project I have in mind. That way, each student would be responsible or in charge of one specific part. To ensure that each member is So this was a curation. Could you guys hear any of that? Yes. Yay. OK, so this was a curation. Um, this is the dastardly word reflection that we ask students to do at the end, often at the end of learning something. So what'd you learn anyhow and how does it matter? So lots of times that gets hidden in conversations or products that are shared just with the instructor. So anything that I think takes us even an inch beyond that is, is helpful, especially if the thing is has a common focus and can be exported out of the or exists or lives outside of the LMS and potentially can be used by students when they leave our course. So this was a what are your learning jobs from this point on and what are you going to use around and this in this case it was about cooperative learning structures. So what did you learn and what do you need to uh, add to your toolbox potentially to use and improve on. So um, I had not done this particular thing, type of thing with VoiceThread before. I've done some other kind of reflective activities, but um, this worked. It worked really, really well. And I asked, this is all I asked students to do in advance, because I think one of the things that we have as a potential challenge when we put the um, the learning into the hands of the student is the one-off approach. So I'm just going to go, I'm going to talk, and I'm going to be done with it. I'm going to get the check mark. Gradle's going to give me credit for it. Um, is I ask them, they don't, I don't use the word storyboard with uh, certain tasks, but I say, in your notes, I need you to outline, you know, three things that you're definitely going to talk about. If you want to do more than outline, it's okay, but your each bullet has to have some words in it so that you can use those as talking points when you get into the voice thread. 
So having them pre-think or pre, I call, I call a lot of things pre, pre-work, pre-think or whatever. Um, and then also in their, in their notes, I ask them to add citations so that I know they're not just pulling it out of their fill in the blank, you know, out of their phone, out of their Google, out of their back pocket. So, um, so I, I think that those underlying things are important as we try to push the envelope around um, getting, getting students to do some of the work. And I just also wanted to end with this other little example. I don't know if you folks have focused on um, um, the CAT strategies, classroom assessment strategies by Angelo and Cross. One of my best friends introduced this, you know, the big, thick cats book to me um, years and years and years ago. And I think it's, it works so well, especially because now we have something beyond paper and pencil tools that will help us. Um, so this is, an, this is just a little example of a skeleton around uh, what do you not understand about circuits in this case? So this is a science methods class. Um, what don't you understand? What questions do you have? What do you think is happening? I like circuits because I don't understand it and I always need a local expert. And so the structure in, in this translation of Maria's points is after everybody types something in, everybody becomes an expert in some way, shape, or form and goes in and types in the second column an answer to the question. And the expert is never me. Um, so using the idea of Muddy's points, which in the cat's lingo is we might pass out index cards collect them at the end of class, we use them to inform our subsequent teaching, etc. In this instance, we would asynchronously have students using the learning experiences we've built for them become the local experts. So I've done this with plagiarism muddiest points log, um, positive behavioral supports muddiest points log, um, research methodology, uh, sampling, and I don't, I try not to, you know, kill, kill it, just do it so much. Um, this, though, has the potential to be so recyclable because this shouldn't be a one-off. I can use this potentially if I give exams as a mini study guide. I can use this information and the answers when I come back into a face-to-face -face class, build it into a cooperative learning or um, structure or into a discussion, etc. So the content gets generated by the students as does the assistants. I think this is like capturing a snapshot of learning over and over and over again. And it is a curation. We can do stuff with it. We can highlight things, color code things, whatever. We can do more with it. This becomes a wonderful initial collection that we can then build on. So I, I just wanted to throw that out because I think lots of times the CAT strategies get um, mentioned but sometimes not get translated into, um, into some practice. So I also did want to quickly mention if you don't already build custom Google search engines, you know you use them all the time because that little search window in almost every uh, site that you're on is typically um, the Google search engine. So I have students build search engines. Um, and what's great about the Google search engine is you have to put the sites into it. So this is the, if you're not familiar with it, you just have to Google, Google custom search, um, sign into your account. That's me. And, um, and then you insert URLs that you want to be part of that uh, bucket that that search engine searches through. 
it creates, after you do that, it creates a unique URL. That URL can be shared with people. And um, then when they use the search engine, search engine to search for things, and I'll pull this one up, it searches for the term in the collection that you've compiled or in the curation that you've compiled. So I might say um, best tools. I don't know. If, I actually don't remember if this is going to work, but we'll try. All right. And of course, I can't get rid of the ads, so we'll click over them. So each one of these results comes from a site that I put into my search engine. Okay, now I can click out of it if I want to. Um, and it, so for students, and I'm, there's nothing I can do about these ads unless I use some extension, but for students to compile search engines around their content that they're responsible for helps them do that sorting, vetting, and rebuilding process. So lots of times for my future teachers, I have them build a search engine directly related to the content that they are compiling for their future students. So that's what this money, 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 money example is. Jillian has let me use it for years. Um, and so she has this little, um, very simple skeleton that she made up of a digital worksheet. And in order for the students to complete the, or to help students get through the understanding or, or get the answers, um, they would click to her search engine and Search, use search terms to locate the answers. And what she did, she did a pretty good job of it, is um, she came up with lower level and higher level questions. So, um, so I have students compile the information, re remix it, and then sometimes create a search engine. What they like best though is to create games that go with the search engine. So, you know, the old Jeopardy game or whatever. Uh, creating those things for a Kahoot and then a search engine to go with it. So use pairing tools that have games associated with the search engine, they like a whole lot more. So I just thought I would would mention that. I think it's another another tackle on curation that, that has worked for me. So one of my very favorite quotes to, to end with is, if you can curate, do it. If not, review. If not, tweet. And then there's always retweeting. So I do a lot of retweeting because I'm so busy trying to do the other stuff. I want to thank you so much for being here. And what questions do you have? But I mean, it seems like there's so much wonderful stuff out there. But I start to dive in, and then I feel like I'm lost in the ocean. Yeah. Well, can you tell what my go-to is? It's a Google Doc table. <laughs> uh, if you start with a Google Doc table or slide deck, I feel like you can't go wrong and you won't get distracted by the bells and whistles. You can take the pedagogy that you're already really great at and say, how can this be done by somebody else building the content? And then I get to, I get to build it into my bag of tricks, my pedagogy. I think if you can think of that as the formula, and I say a, a table, gosh, I love tables, I love slide decks, that simplifies things or pick one curation tool and beat it to death. You know, love it to death and use it like crazy and have students use it. Each one of these curation tools has a free venue. Sometimes if the links don't last real long, like Bundler, 
Um, but I wouldn't even go there if you are already comfortable with something that will do this for you or that your students have access to. Um, and I think innovating like the turtle, you're seeing examples that I've built over the years. You know, um, for example, the maps example, psh, that was last semester. Uh, at certain points during that project, I didn't mention in the last session, I thought all my hair was gonna fall out. <laughs> Um, so, and, and that's the other thing, is um, plan for that experiment to happen and don't change everything else at the same time, you know? Or plan it at a time when normally it's a, nothing is a throwaway time, but there are some throwaway times, like that week before a break. Um, you know what I mean? There's, a, there's times in the semester where you're going like this. This is review time. Great. This is a perfect opportunity for me to not do any work. Students, please compile the review guide for our exam and come up with um, a game that will help us really want to know this stuff and let them do it and see what happens. If they blow it, that's okay. They still got to study for the exam. You know what I mean? So, so I'm a lazy instructor, and that's why I love curation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was a great question. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Once again. <laughs>